Hi, and welcome to the Modern Persian Food Podcast. We are food bloggers, Bita Arabian and Bita Nazim Kelly, and we're here to share with you the rich flavors and fresh ingredients of Persian cooking and how to incorporate them into today's modern lifestyles. We're excited to introduce you to the flavors, tastes, and techniques we use, and also our own cultural stories and perspectives growing up in the U.S. in a Persian family. Thank you for joining us. Hello, here we are, episode 27. Today, we're going to talk about Persian breakfast. Hi, Bita June. Hi there. Here with my co-host, Bita. We're going to talk about the first meal of the day. What comes to mind when we think about Persian breakfasts? and some of our favorite things to make from a Persian breakfast menu. So, Bita June, when you think of Persian breakfast, what do you think of? Persian breakfast is one of my favorite things to share with other people. I really enjoy hosting Persian brunch with my friends. And I have a few different elements that goes into when I'm hosting Persian brunch. The main focal point of the table is usually some sort of egg dish that I like to have, some sort of kind of like showstopper, big platter of something that I've cooked with eggs. And these are different meals that are called, Persians tend to call them omelette or omelette, even though it's not your traditional sense of having like an omelette that's folded it over, but it's more just like cooked into the pan. There's different versions. There's one called nargisi, which is basically cooking some spinach and then cracking eggs directly into the pan and having like poached eggs. That can be also switched up with some tomatoes, saute the tomatoes a little bit, and it looks really beautiful with sunny side up eggs all in a big platter. Another version of that is with sosis, which is like a hot dog or sausage. You can add some of your own spices and have that with the eggs. So I really enjoy having kind of like a showstopper main dish that usually incorporates eggs. When I think of Persian breakfast or brunch, I think about jam, eating jam with bread and feta cheese or with butter. I really love having like two or three different kinds of jams. I love making fig jam. Also quince jam is very special, the beautiful red color of the quince jam. Those are some of my favorite jams to make. I have recipes for those and I really enjoy, especially when they are in season, to stock up on them and share them with my friends. You have a few jam recipes that you like to make too, right? Mm-hmm. First of all, your brunches sound amazing. I would love to come to your brunch one day. I love breakfast. Those omelets sound amazing. The way you described your central egg dish reminded me of my family would always have Sunday brunch. So in the morning, we all slowed down and we tried to do like a big brunch and my mom would make omelet. And mm-hmm. it was like a Persian omelet, Maman's omelet was a lot like the one you described. It had the tomato sauce, vegetables, peppers. Hers had mushrooms. Just really delicious and unique. Mm -hmm. So that I consider to be like a once a week thing. I really enjoy it. But then definitely on a daily basis, when I think of Persian breakfast, I definitely think of Nuno Morabo, like you said, the bread and the jam. Mm -hmm. And fruit is a big part of all of Persian eating. So in the morning, it comes in that jam form. Uh And yeah, I have a couple of compotes, compote, Uh (laughs) Um, jam recipes. My favorite to eat in Persian breakfast would be, I love like the fluffy babari bread, Mm -hmm. warm with butter, with rose jam, or morabayabe, which is Mm -hmm. the quince jam. And you said you have a recipe for quince jam. Mm -hmm. I do. I've never made quince jam, but It's so aromatic. It's got some cardamom hints. Mm -hmm. What do you put in your quince jam? Remind me. You know, the quince jam is actually super simple to make. And the quince itself is actually naturally perfumed. A ripe quince fruit, it smells so delicious. So yes, you can add cardamom to it or um, rose water to it. But I actually love super simple, just the essence of the quince itself. So it's quince, it's water, and sugar. And that's basically all it is. You dissolve the sugar in the water first, and then you put thin slices of the quince inside and let it cook 
slowly, once the quince has softened and you make sure that it's submerged under the sugar water, the syrup essentially, once it's softened, then you put a damkwini on. And a damkwini again is like what we use for rice. We put this a few layers of paper towel or a piece of thin fabric that we wrap the lid of the pot with. You cover the lid with that and you put it on top of the pot and let it simmer like that for like two hours. And you have to check it periodically just to make sure that all the quince is submerged. What results is a beautiful ruby colored jam. The quince itself is initially very pale. It's like a very pale yellow color, but it transforms into this beautiful color. It's fun to have that on the breakfast table. You mentioned fruit. There's also fresh fruit all the time. That's like kind of like a staple of the Persian breakfast, as are some nuts, walnuts, almonds. A lot of time those are soaked. They become very tender and delicious. Yeah. Where I find my rose and quince jam, because I don't make them from scratch, is from a Middle Eastern market or a Persian market. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's hard for me to find rose jam. Sometimes I'll find like a Greek version or a Turkish version, mm -hmm. but a good rose jam is like nothing else. I will sometimes mix it into yogurt or whole wheat pita as a healthier version with jam and tea is a big part of it. And tea, you're right. Yeah, the bread, butter, jam, and tea. And it's so good. It's so good. I like it as a treat. I don't have it every single day, but I... Love it. And then my jam recipes that I have are not traditional in terms of Persian types of jams. I have a sour plum jam recipe that's like sweet and sour. Mm -hmm. And it's really delicious when plums are in season. And then I also have a honeydew melon jam. Both my jam recipes are low sugar. So the honeydew melon jam, if you get ripe honeydew, mm -hmm. it's really sweet on its own. And you just cook it down and pectin comes out and the sugars. I just add a touch of honey. Mm -hmm. and maybe a little bit of lemon juice. And it's really interesting and different and light. So those are the ones that I have. But you know what we haven't talked about in this episode is a hmm. really unique and interesting Persian breakfast, which is halim. Yes, that's right. Halim is a favorite breakfast item for a lot of people. Some people aren't a huge fan of it. And me personally, I really like it, but I can really only have small portions of it. It can be pretty rich. And basically what it is is oats, or barley cooked in a broth with typically turkey meat, but you can use chicken if you would like to too. And it's like cooked and simmered for a long period of time. And essentially it becomes like this creamy porridge. And the traditional way that it's served is with melted butter on top, cinnamon and sugar sprinkled on top of it too. It's a cozy, comforting, warm dish. Some people love it. Like I said, some people don't love it so much. Do you like it? I love hearing about your porridge. It's like savory and sweet. And my mother-in-law makes a big batch of it after Thanksgiving with leftover turkey. Yeah. And a it's a huge treat. It's really, really nice and nutritious and has protein and is filling and delicious. But the daily I make breakfast bowls, mm -hmm. either steel cut or rolled oats every day. I put tons of fruit in there. I like to start my day with loads of fruit. Mm -hmm. But I do use some Persian-ish fruit. Like I like putting fresh figs. I love putting pomegranate arrows and, you know, nuts and walnuts and seeds and really loaded breakfast bowl that'll pretty much carry me over until lunchtime. How do you start your day on a daily basis? The breakfast that I usually eat during the week is kind of like fly by my pants, what's available, what can I eat really quickly? I like to have hard boiled eggs on hand. And that's another thing that I remember growing up eating is like soft boiled eggs. You get the little soft boiled egg and you have a little stand for it. You take the top off and you kind of like eat it with a spoon. I really loved that. Although these days I usually just make a batch of hard boiled eggs and I have them in the fridge. And then when I'm, you know, starting off my day and I need a little jolt of that, I'll have one of those. I like to have like a smoothie sometimes for breakfast. I'm really a big fan of avocado toast. If I have cilantro or some sort of fresh herb and put that on top of it, that just brightens it up a little bit with a little bit of lemon. Lemon, I feel, is just definitely such a Persian fruit that adding lemon to something definitely Persianifies it for me. You know, one of the jams that we didn't mention that I feel is very Persian is the sour cherry jam, al balu. Mm, oh, yeah. Love that one. That's like a really special one. I don't make that one. That's another one that you can sometimes find in a Greek version. It's really good. 
Another jam that's actually very easy to make as well is uh, carrot jam. And Yasmin Khan, who the author of the Saffron Tales, she makes a really easy one in her cookbook. And it's essentially just like shredded carrots. And, you know, the cheat in me is like, oh, I could just get like, you know, the shredded little carrots that you get in the package from the grocery store in the produce section. It's like you can just use that and orange zest and sugar. And again, a lot of these Persian jams has natural occurring pectin in it. And you slow cook it and then the pectin comes out. And in this case of the orange peel comes out and it like makes the jam jam super rich and thick and lovely. That's a great cheat. I have the shredded carrots right now in my refrigerator and our orange tree is bursting with fruit that I don't know what to do with. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, there you go. Or even you can even make like an orange marmalade. Mm -hmm. It can be very bitter. So the way that Persians actually make that orange peel marmalade is you can get the orange peel, you slice it into thin strips and you boil that three different times. You boil it, you drain it, you boil it, you drain it. You do that three times before you then start cooking it with the sugar. You can also soak it. And those strategies are to get the bitterness out. Mm -hmm. But orange marmalade is beautiful, as is other citrus jams. We could just talk on and on about jams. Yeah, exactly. Persian breakfast is so unique. And I hope that you can have your brunch parties again soon. Do we have an Ask the Beats for today? Yes, we do. Today's Ask the Beats comes from Instagram, and the question is, what are the hardest parts of Persian cooking? That's a great question. Yeah, that is a great question, because I think we try to say it's easy, or we try to give shortcuts to make it easier. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of challenges when you cook Persian food. Yeah, I think my greatest challenge when I want to make Persian dishes is to have all the ingredients that I need. A lot of the things that I want to make require fresh, Mm -hmm. and I don't always have them on hand. So Mm -hmm. I think I have most of the spices and the staples in my pantry. But for example, I want to make ash today, and I have like everything except for a couple of the fresh herbs that I really like to have in there. So, you know, that's usually what keeps me from doing it is when I'm missing ingredients. Yeah, I hear you. I have like a fine line of that I teeter on of like, do I have all the ingredients that I need? Can I take different shortcuts that will still preserve the integrity of the dish and yet will keep the integrity of the dish and be satisfying yet have all those flavors that I associate with that dish? Can I make it with what I have? And a lot of times I do. And a lot of times I just kind of make it work and knowing that like, yeah, if I were to make this all from scratch or give the proper attention and time to making a dish perfect, that would be great. But I probably wouldn't do it if I needed to be be super specific. So I kind of switch like the Osh recipe. If I don't have the exact right beans for it, I'll substitute a different kind of beans. I don't have red beans, but I'll throw pinto beans in there, you know, and I kind of just like make it work for myself. And I do you have a few cheats like I really enjoy having like frozen spinach on hand to make some of those green dishes, the stuff in your pantry or mentioning like dried herbs and spices. I think that those go a long way in making some of the dishes that are Persian and that require some specialty ingredients. Those are great points. Yeah. If we get stuck on perfect, we're never going to make the thing. And sometimes the best recipes come by accident or we don't have something and we make a substitute. Yeah. And for example, you know, putting pinto beans in when you don't have the kidney beans or what have you, and it tastes even better. Yeah. Or realizing that a dry herb has different type of flavor than the fresh and maybe that's okay. Exactly. So what's the hardest thing for you when it comes to cooking Persian food? For me, the hardest part of cooking Persian food really is dedicating the time to it. And that's, I guess, why I'm always looking for different cheats or trying to come up with shortcuts so that I can actually do it because I don't have a lot of time to dedicate to it. I do cook a lot. I do eat out a lot. My family, you know, we try to balance having both. But like, I really enjoy and appreciate having Persian food throughout the week for me and my family. So really, the hardest part for me is the time that it takes to do it. So I try to plan out some of my week and some of my meal plans so that I know, okay, like I have these ingredients, I'm going to make this with it later in the week or whatever it may be. So just really carving out time is the hardest part for me. That makes sense. Yeah. And I'm kind of flexible. If I try a recipe and it's not like the best of whatever, like I'm okay with that. Like I'm not going to grieve over that my recipe didn't turn out great, but I'm going to just appreciate that I made the effort and not be so hard on myself. 
it all comes down to balance, right? So like you said, maybe you do take out for part of it, but then you made Mm -hmm. one thing or, you know, that night of nachos Mm -hmm. or pizza, but then the night of when you made everything from scratch. So it all just comes down to balance and doing the best that Mm -hmm. we can. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Mita Jun. Thank you so much, Mita Jun. And thanks for joining. Until next time. Bye-bye. So you've been listening to Modern Persian Food with Bita and Bita. Thanks for spending time with us. If you enjoyed what you heard today, consider telling your friends or giving us a good rating on iTunes. You can subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcasting app or find us online at modernpersianfood.com for recipes and info that we talked about today. Thanks so much. We'd love to hear your thoughts and see you next time. Thank you.